changing public perception to allow digital health ecosystems to flourish. Hello, I'm Ryan Grech, one of the co-founders of Digital Health Malta. I would like to welcome you to this panel um, entitled Changing Public Perception to Allow Digital Health Ecosystems to Flourish, which will delve into the need for digital health ecosystems to support this rapid growth of medtech. So joining me today are Professor Shamin Gauchi, Superintendent of Public Health in Malta and an Associate Professor within the University of Malta with a special interest in epidemiology, communicable disease and health promotion. Another panelist, panelist excuse me, Dr. Dylan Attart, colleague co-founder of Digital Health Malta with a passion for digital health, currently a surgical trainee. And finally, Dr. Stefan Butlijic, another colleague of co-founder of Digital Health Malta, specialist in public health and vice president within the European Public Health Association. So starting the topic off, um, I think my first question is to you, Professor Gauci. I think that public health has never been so important um, than, than the, the current um, age we're living in. The coordinated response that we've seen from the public health teams in many different countries, including Malta, they have definitely saved lives. What do you feel has been the most important tool to this success? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be with such an esteemed panel of people and also dedicated people. So basically COVID-19 um, has come at a time whereby we were on our way to plan things into digital health. However, what happened was that um, the COVID came so suddenly that we started seeing a number of cases. And as the number of cases started to increase, we found ourselves that we needed to have the tools to be able to help us. And what happened was that we started off immediately with digital technology so that it will help us in our work. And this has helped us a lot. And in fact, today I say, I wish we had introduced all these tools that we have today before at the very beginning, or even if we had been prepared even before. So we have set up a lot of systems. One of them is the Go Data, which is um, an adapted database from WHO, which was actually um, first set up to deal with the Ebola outbreak. However, this has been adapted by the very good people we have, which I'm pleased to say that they are public health specialists as well. One of them is Stefan, who is um, on this panel as well. And this has been adapted to deal with COVID. So it gives us um, all the information that we need in terms of the public health aspects. There are other things which have helped us along the way. One of them is also um, linking the results that we give to the patients um, through also digital health. So a patient um, does the test, gets the result through even my health system, which is the national database for um, getting all the results. And we have linked this very beautifully, which is very good, even for getting the results very fast, but also even now in the age where we have countries asking for a negative test before traveling, they can actually show their my health um, COVID results actually there and then to at the airport. So this has been one of the things which has advanced a lot. We have also advanced into going into using the tools to support our structure. So one of them is um, symptom, symptom Checker, whereby we have a web-based technology whereby we actually ask people to input their symptoms and this will guide them on the risk for COVID. And this will actually also guide them whether they will need to go for a test. So this, apart from giving us the information of the symptomatology that we have out there in the community. So we will have this syndromic and surveillance in the community, but also will guide the people to actually and encourage them to go for testing, which is very important, especially for people who are symptomatic. And then um, we have our contact tracing app, the COVID Alert Malta, which has um, been taken up um, very fast. In fact, it's been three weeks now, and we have over 70 um, K people who have actually taken up this and installed this app. And if you look at the uptake of the population, it's almost now 15% of the population who um, can actually have a, a, a phone um, who has actually taken this up and downloaded and installed this on, his, on their phone, which is an excellent um, uptake from our end because if you look at other countries, they have actually um, taken this uptake very, very, very slowly. But in Malta, that has been taken up very fast. And we actually already started um, seeing positive cases, actually inputting the code, and actually people 
who are actually receiving the alert and they call our helpline and actually also go for testing. So this is picking up cases which um, the human being um, without the support of digital um, technology will not be able to cope. So these are just a few snippets. To me, um, COVID has made us do advances um, in digital health, which we would have taken years to do. I think it's actually quite encouraging uh, what you're mentioning. I think the uptake, is, especially when compared to other European countries, is quite magnificent. Um, where unfortunately, um, countries like France, countries like the UK, um, the engagement might not have been as 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 good. Um, turning on to you, Dylan, now keeping with the theme of COVID-19. So Digital Health Malta, a recently founded NGO, yet with its limited resources, it still contributed to the pandemic response. Can you take us a bit through how it kind of did so? All right. Um, so first of all, thank you, um, Matt Tech Summit, for the invitation. I mean, it's an honor for Digital Health Malta as a small association to be able to, first of all, help help it organize the, the, the panel as well as participate in, the, in this panel. Um, now, moving on to your question, I mean, obviously, like many other countries, initial COVID-19 wave took us by surprise. I mean, even Malta as a small island, we always thought that we were safe from the rest of the world, sort of like in a bubble and no pandemic is ever going to reach us. However, it did. And cases started increasing um, exponentially in the first couple of days and weeks. And now, us being doctors, um, as co-founders of the Jet Malta, we were also um, suffering from the pressure of increased work at hospital, um, as well as increased responsibilities and the, the working roster. So whilst trying to maintain um, and serve our responsibilities at work at, hosp at hospital, working on the front line as best as we could, we also had the um, responsibility to use um, to utilize digital health Malta as best as we can and try to help Malta fight off the pandemic through whatever means we could. Now, obviously, Digital Health Malta, our means were um, trying to deploy um, digital health tools. The first tool which we launched, uh, which we launched was an automated chatbot on Facebook, which we named um, when, when Young, um, after the first doctor who, who was the first to issue. Um, emergency warnings um, regarding this, this this different sort of pneumonia and we launched it on Facebook as a sort of small Facebook page and um, as a surprising lecture um, people were started people were exponentially started to 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 interact with it I mean the first couple of days there was like a rather slow response but um, eventually made, we also made it onto the news and people were interacting with it asking the, 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 the various questions that they had during the, the, the initial waves of COVID. I mean, now, six months after, or, or how many months, um, everyone is sort of like um, a, a professional in answering these questions. But I mean, at first, people didn't know what's a virus, what's a bacteria, whether they were taking antibiotics. And this chatbot, this simple chatbot on Facebook, was serving to, to answer these questions, as well as supplementing the, or the good work that the, the local healthcare authorities, public health, um, were, were doing. Um, another tool which we launched was a telemedicine platform. Us being doctors and working, um, our, co our colleagues being GPs or other healthcare practitioners, we were noticing that they were have, having trouble to open their their face-to-face -face clinics with either to protect themselves as well as their patients. So they wanted to connect with their patients online, but um, most didn't know how to connect. Was, was Facebook safe? Was WhatsApp safe? Um, how are they going to pay us? Um, and so sort of Digital Health Malta stepped in to launch um, Malta's first telemedicine platform. It was a fully fledged telemedicine platform with all the, the tools um, like an electronic healthcare record um, to, to ensure that the, the healthcare practitioners were connected with their patients. And Digital Health Malta had also the means, fortunately, to, to be able to sponsor this platform and offer it free of charge to the healthcare practitioners. So it didn't, we didn't take any charges. We, um, invited and an, an healthcare practitioner interested to, to to log in on this platform and offer his service and connect with the patients online. Um, I mean, even though with our limited funds as an, and as an, as an association, we managed to, to in, the fair, in the initial couple of weeks of the, this pandemic to, to launch this platform. And apart from helping Malta fight the pandemic, apart from helping people, um, patients connect with their healthcare practitioners, we were trying, we were um, starting, kicking off the revolution of utilizing digital health tools. I mean, if you had to ask people a year ago to connect with their patients, uh, with their doctors um, online through a formal service, and for example, they had to pay or else to to, com to communicate to communicate with a health chatbot on Facebook, and they would either have loved or just dismissed the, the idea. 
Um, so it was kind of exciting for Digital Health Malta to help kick off this, this, this digital health revolution and help the local authorities um, fight, fight this pandemic. Thanks for that, Dylan. Um, moving on from Digital Health Malta now a bit to you, Stefan. So I think we've both been working now for a number of years when it comes to digital health, you probably more than, than I have. Um, and I think in the past, me personally, I have felt like I was kind of paddling against the current when it comes to um, digital health, finding resistance in general from, from the whole healthcare industry, really. Do you feel that, particularly as Prof. Gauchi mentioned earlier, thanks to COVID, um, the shift in public perception of digital health has started? Thanks, uh, Ryan, and uh, thanks for, like, for, for all of us for being here today. Yes, there has been change, and I think one of, one of the most important things that happened here is that we have collected now uh, a robust evidence base that basically states that digital health interventions are widely accepted in Malta. Before there was this uh, thought that, oh no, so that technology, I don't think they will take it up, you know, the older age group, they won't, they won't use digital health, start there. Oh, they don't use the smartphone. Uh, so there were a lot, there was a lot of this perception, both internally and externally, that these tools won't be used. What we know is that this pandemic has proven us otherwise. And for example, when we launched COVID-19 check as part of the public health response team, for example, we had, uh, let's say, like incredible response. And uh, by the end of the pandemic, now it has kind of calmed down a bit, but we had 43,000 submissions plus. Like that means like how many times the, f the full form or the full workflow was completed. That's quite encouraging. You have the app downloads of the uh, COVID-19 a contact tracing app, COVID Alert Mode. We also, for a short while, we also had um, Covi, which was a chatbot which was specifically designed for Mota. And that in the beginning, even that we collected evidence that it was used. We had to wind it down simply because uh, we were focusing our energies on other important projects, which were very, very important anyways, and which fulfilled our role, but was critical to see that people actually Check it out. Also, we mentioned Facebook. Imagine uh, televised press briefings, so many people watching them. If you just, even if you just see on the top left corner of every live stream, how many people watch the stream, I think Prof. Charmaine will be more than happy to tell you the numbers, but big numbers. So these are all different kinds of digital health interventions. Even for example, in primary healthcare, uh, we, I believe that just in the first few weeks, for example, the first two, three weeks, we had more than 20K telemedicine consultations there. You know, like all of these. So you had the public, you had the private, and bringing it all together, started realizing that, oh, yes, people use digital health. And one last thing that I even forgot to mention is that even my health, for example, there was an increased uptake, which was immense. Uh, so if you I guess it looks like kind of the, the wheels are in motion and the, 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 the cogs are in motion and we're finally seeing that people, if you educate them correctly, I think they, 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 they do uptake these, these things. And like we we're saying, Stefan, I think um, Malta did quite well in, in, in a lot of this digital health um, input for, for the pandemic. And to that end, I think, Professor Gauss, if I can turn back to you, you know, what is your vision of a more digitally enabled public health in Malta? How does kind of math tech and digital health fit into the picture? Yes, in fact, um, what I say is that many people are um, longing um, uh, to have this pandemic over. Um, true, everyone, I think even the whole public health um, team wish to have um, some time to, to ourselves. However, I really believe that some of the things that we have learned some of the systems that we have inputted, we need to keep. For example, Stefan mentioned um, the fact that we televise our briefings, our COVID bulletins um, on Facebook. Okay, So we see how many people are actually able to actually see it at that point in time, but also be able to see it later whenever they can find some time. So that is providing all the information at the right point in time to the people who can see it at any point in time of their day. So this is one important means of communications that we have set up 
indeed we also did the setup all in house um, so we can actually continue doing this uh, also not only for covid but also for other topics what's important as well is that you have features for example when we had the height of the pandemic we didn't used to get the journalists within the room we used to communicate also with the journalists so the journalists were participating with us asking the usual questions as well as they do even in person so we used to manage to fulfill all the things that we used to do when we are face to face something else which i really want to keep and i insist that we will keep is that um, before we used to commute from one place to the other for meetings like i used to like waste a lot of my time um, going from one place to the other to do to have meetings with other people i know it's nice to meet people physically however we can do um without actually meeting people uh, physically what good as well for example i had an urgent meeting today which i had to call within 5 minutes that couldn't be done with a physical meeting so i actually um sent an invitation to seven people and actually we were in line within 5 minutes so we did the meeting and all is over. I mean, you can easily also work from home. So before we used to say, I need the phone, I need this. When you have a meeting, I will come in to work. But we can work from home. So this is even more better, even for family-friendly measures. So we can have um, people who will have their own family, can continue to take care of their younger children. Perhaps they have older relatives and they need to take care of their older relatives. So what we have learned through this pandemic these tools that we have included i wish that we need to continue using them so this is something which we have learned if we want to do something i believe um that covid forced us to do some things perhaps but we need to learn that if we really want to do something let's do them when it's the right time thank you so i think like professor Kaush is saying digital has now been ingrained in our lives and we've just have uh, only <laughs> around 3 minutes left so um i'll i'll, I'll um, turn to you, Stefan, and if you can keep it a bit brief, if that's okay. So um, basically, do you feel that digital health more has importance as a strategic pillar in digital health is currently being recognized or will need to be recognized eventually? Definitely. I mean, digital health more will bring together four main pillars, which is research uh, slash academia, all the other NGOs, so it's not just Digital Health Mota, but also, for example, NGOs like Mota Health Network. Mm -hmm. You have the government, which also plays an important role. And uh, you have the private industry. And the fact that we're a voluntary organization uh, strategically positions us to be non-biased and at the same time offer like a robust network to help us move forward as a nation when it comes to digital health. Thank you. So um, let's turn our final intervention now a bit more international. Um, Dylan, so COVID, I think, had a lot of negatives. And what we've been seeing over the past um, 20 minutes is that it certainly has accelerated digital health transformation. Now, whereas in most industries, I think investment has perhaps slowed down, the narrative in the context of digital health has been quite the opposite. I think um, I, I've read that in the US, the investment in digital health, in health sorry, has kept on booming. And I think the latest estimates for Q3 were around $4.6 billion dollars invested in digital health, which is a phenomenal number. So this trend has been increasing similarly in Europe. Dylan, do you think that this will go on or is it you know, kind of just the latest trend? Um, I personally think that this will, is def will definitely continue to um, keep, keep going on and eventually also increase. Um, I mean, this is very exciting, especially for um, us doctors, us frontliners, us healthcare practitioners. Um, the healthcare industry is going to be undergoing um, some very exciting changes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next coming months. Um, COVID has fortunately um, aimed to be one of the accelerators to, to bring about this change. Um, I mean, before tele, um, digital health, telemedicine, for example, more specifically, um, they were facing considerable barriers from policymakers and business organizations, which were most concerned about, um, for example, patient safety. Um, some poly, and they were even designing some policies which were actually there to protect the businesses under them, for example, the patients. Um, and these restrictions were becoming, were, be, were being, were 
it decreasing or easing of um, slightly before COVID. Um, now they're being even lifted further. So this pandemic is shedding the light on the benefits um, of, for example, the safe remote testing of the benefits of digital health, of associating technology with healthcare. Um, so yes, I do think that um, the digital health, um, the healthcare industry in general, even especially in Malta, um, is, we're going to um, some very exciting coming months um, when it comes to investments and digital health infrastructure. So it's great to hear. Um, so I think that what, what we saw in these past 20 minutes is that digital health is truly one of the answers to improving healthcare in general. Obviously, it's not just the only one. I think that a supportive ecosystem is required for the acceleration of, of digital health. And I think, um, like Stefan earlier hinted to as well, that you know public education is really quite key in order to ensure that people understand the benefits and the limitations of, of digital after all. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. It's been great having you on and I want to thank you for being here.